In this video, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know to make your first pack of drag and drop presets for DaVinci Resolve. We're going to make a title, we're going to make a transition, we're going to make an effect, and we're going to make a generator. And if you don't know what a generator is, don't worry about it. We will definitely get to it. Now, two things right up front. Number one, this video is going to be very long. I know that. Number two, this video is still just an introduction. <laughs> I've been making presets and plugins and templates for DaVinci Resolve for over three years now, and there uh, is a lot to it. As much stuff as is in DaVinci Resolve and is in the Fusion page, you can put into presets and plugins and templates. But I'm hoping I can cover um, enough of what you need to know so that you can make something uh, that is cool, that is exciting, that inspires you to uh, dive deeper into Fusion and to make your own cool stuff. Other important stuff up front, uh, everything I'm going to show you, you can do in the free version of DaVinci Resolve. That's pretty cool. And while I am going to functionally walk you through step by step uh, when we are in the Fusion page building effects, this will also not serve as a general introduction to the Fusion page. If you want to build your own effects in the Fusion page to make drag and drop presets on the edit page, you will just need to dedicate a lot more time to just learn Fusion on its own. But there's a whole lot I want to cover uh, in this video, uh, including some really exciting stuff about how to package up your final bundle of effects so they're super easy to share or even sell. Uh, stick around for all of that. Uh, but I think now we can, you know, get started. Now, even before we jump into Resolve, there is a little bit of essential groundwork we have to cover because what we are dealing with in this video is macros. DaVinci Resolve is a big program. It's very complex. There are lots of different ways to bring in outside resources or effects and use them in your videos. Now, as you might have noticed when I've talked about uh, presets, plugins, and templates, I usually bundle all of those together um, because when I make something, I use those kind of interchangeably depending on the specific product. But whatever I have created, I have made inside the Fusion page natively in Resolve, and I do that with the macro system. What is a macro? A macro is a bundle of nodes from the Fusion page that Resolve can read and just sort of run that Fusion composition without the end user needing to build the whole thing themselves. And if you've spent any time in DaVinci Resolve, you've probably um, already been using this feature. I'm here in Resolve in a new project in a blank timeline. And if I go to uh, any of these folders in my toolbox, my effects toolbox here, you know, transitions, titles, generators, or effect, I have titles and then I have fusion titles. I have generators and then I have fusion generators. I have effects and then fusion effects. And a great example is in titles. Um, and this trips up a lot of new users. We have text and then text plus. If I drag text on my uh, timeline, boom, it's a text tool, you can change settings. If I drag text plus on the timeline, it seems like kind of the same thing, but you might notice in text plus, it has this little icon here, and the standard text tool does not. If I click that icon, it will open the Fusion page. And you'll see the only nodes we have here are a media out node, which sends whatever you do in the Fusion page back to the edit page, and this template node. And this template node, uh, if you click on it in the inspector, you have all the same tools you just had on the edit page. And that is because this template is a copy of the standard text plus tool in the Fusion page. I'm clicking between them, but you see this one already has custom title. This one doesn't. And it's all these controls that you have from the standard text tool that they've just moved to the edit page. Now, it's very easy to start stepping this up. Um, one of my favorite things to show off is over in Generators. I'm going to scroll down to this Contours Fusion Generator. I drag this on my timeline, and boom, we've got a pretty cool little wavy effect. But lots of cool stuff is happening in the inspector. You have some controls, but also at the top you have these versions. And if I click through these versions, we have drastically different looks. Uh, these all look pretty different. Uh, I really like this third one. If you select that and scroll uh, down, pull up movement a little bit, you get this really cool sort of warping topography map-like effect. Now here's the really exciting thing. Kind of like the text plus had that button to open in the Fusion page, this contours effect does as well. Now think about this complicated effect that can give you all of these different looks. If I click this button, it will open it in the Fusion page, and we have that Contours node, but if you zoom in, you see it's actually a group of nodes. And if I double click to expand that, you'll see this entire effect is just four different nodes in the Fusion page. You can select any of these and press one or two to pull them up on your viewer. We have some fast noise, 
Now we pipe into a background, we have a shadows effect, then we have a duplicate effect. And if we click back to that main contours group and click through these versions, you can relook at all those different effects and see how they uh, are built layered on top of each other. But you also might notice that each of these nodes have all of their own tools in the inspector. So these nodes have controls, but also the whole group has controls. And this is what a macro does. When you go through the process to create a macro, you select nodes you want to group together, and then you select which controls you want to uh, pull or sort of duplicate from each individual node, pull up to this master control group level. So the end user only sees what you want them to have access to. It keeps things simple, it keeps things pretty smooth. And in a lot of macros, you also retain this ability to hop into the Fusion page if you need even more control or customization. This version functionality um, is pretty cool. Uh, we might cover this later, we'll see how things go. Um, if I don't, remind me. I'm pretty sure I've already made a video about it before, but remind me and I might make another video. I might say that a few times in this video as well. And I think the last bit of introductory housekeeping um, has to do um, with these folders themselves. So you have transitions, titles, generators, and effects. And there's some interplay when you're creating any of these effects because um, the type of effect you're making will dictate some of the necessary structure while you're building it, how many inputs you have to leave open, if any, that sort of stuff. But also, Resolve will handle your presets differently depending on what folder you drop them into. For instance, a title and generator, you can drop right on the timeline and it will sort of create a clip. Uh, but if I pull in some footage here and go to effects, something simple like an RGB split effect, that doesn't live on its own on the timeline, that has to be applied directly to footage. But then I can do that, pull up the distance, and we hey, have a little RGB split. Likewise, a transition, you know, needs to be at a transition point with plenty of footage from both clips to, you know, fade or however you want to transition in between the two. Okay, okay. Um, we will circle back to most of this as we get into how to uh, preview or install your effects as we build them. But for now, let's build something. I'm gonna to come to effects, uh, scroll all the way up to just a fusion composition and open that up in the fusion page and boom, we are in fusion. The only thing we have is this media out, which uh, I said before, anything we do in the fusion page will get piped in there back to the edit page. So the first thing we're gonna make is a uh, drag and drop title. That's pretty cool. We are going to keep this pretty basic um, because we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna build on stuff. I'm gonna click this third icon here to pull in uh, that text tool we were looking at before. I will connect that up. And in the text, I can just start to cite, type something like, boom, Patrick Sterling. Then right out of the box, uh, I'm gonna pull this horizontal anchor. That will shift the text over, but really uh, what that is doing is, you know, changing that anchor point. So now as I type, it will just move off to the side instead of expanding from the middle. And I want a little uh, box behind this text. So I'm gonna come over to this shading elements tab come to shading element two, turn that on. By default, it's this little red line, but I want to make that a solid box under appearance. I'm changing the level from character to text, and boom, we've got one box for all of that. I'll probably make that something dark, maybe just like a, a dark gray. Maybe a little darker gray. And wow, we've got a title. <laughs> Now we're gonna animate uh, this onto our screen in two different ways. We're gonna have the box slide onto our screen and then the text fade on. So if I come to uh, this first text tab, I'm gonna right click inside this window and I'm gonna make a follower. That's applied as a modifier, I will click that. And this is your main text animation engine. Uh, so I'm gonna change this delay to between the first and the last character, pull up the delay to something like 12, I've usually found that's pretty solid for most like 24 or 30 frames per second stuff. And then I'm gonna come back to the shading element tab. I'll come to something like 10 frames. And I'm gonna set a keyframe on this opacity. Now this can be a little complicated. I mean, this the text plus tool and then the follower modifier on top of it can be, like I could do a, a many, many hour long video just on those, but we're just doing this. So I'm gonna set a keyframe for opacity. And what this sort of does is override um, this parameter from the main tool. So I have set that keyframe at an opacity of one at 10 frames. If I come up to 20, set another keyframe. And if I go back, pull that all the way down 
as I play, you'll notice that it's coming in one letter at a time, so that finishes, you know, uh, 30, 35 frames, something like that. And I'll do something kind of similar at the end. I'll come to what, like 120, 125? I'll do 120, set a keyframe, come forward 10 frames, uh, pull that down again, so then now it'll fade back out. This is timed pretty well so that it fades all the way out, but we're also gonna slide this, remember? So we have that text animating, but then we can animate um, this background, which remember they're tied together. So if I go back to the tools, I can hop over to layout and I have point controls here. Um, it looks like I am just sliding the box, but this is on the general text tool. So now as that text slides in or fades in, it is still inside the box. So I can sort of position this down in the corner and there are some tools that again we'll cover later, but we're just gonna bake in some of this animation now. So I'll go to keyframe zero, keyframe, come all the way up to 10 and set another keyframe, then back slide this off. And then my last 10 frames do the same thing. 10 frames, slide that back off. So now it's off, it slides on, animates on, holds, animates off, slides off. Now, some of the savvy among you might realize that those keyframes are completely linear. Um, if I select that tool, pull up the spline viewer, and then select that displacement, uh, I'm gonna click this little button to zoom to our animation, you see a visual representation of what we've just keyframed. It's a little tricky because this is a displacement on a path, and that's because this is point data, it's storing both X and Y. So you see it moves on, holds, and then even though it's moving back to that same position, um, that displacement of the path is going uh, up to that uh, final value. This entire move is happening between one and zero. But for some real simple easing, I can just click in this window and click F and it will ease each of those a little bit. If you wanna go more, you can select your keyframes and click T and pull up the ease in and ease out. But I think we're gonna stick with that solid sort of easy ease 30 for now. And now it's a little smoother fades on, you know what? I'm actually gonna pull it up just a little bit. So that move takes a little bit longer sort of as that fade is happening too. Yep, and then slides and fades out. And boom, you've got a title. Now, what do you do? You might think it's time to package this up for the edit page, but there is one very important thing we have to think about beforehand, and that is timing. We have hard baked in keyframes here. We're on a 30 frames per second timeline. Uh, the default length for that fusion clip is five seconds. So if we were to package this up as is, then we could drop it on a timeline and we could even extend that fusion clip out, but this animation would still play over those same five seconds. What we need is a way to actually change or delay these keyframes um, and have them react to what happens on the edit page. And we have a pretty cool tool for that. It's called the keyframe stretcher. Now, luckily this is a pretty uh, simple effect. And even though we didn't add any other uh, nodes for this title, even though we could have, I'm gonna select this text. I'm gonna press shift space to pull up this search bar for tools. And if I start typing in uh, keyframe stretcher, it's the first thing that comes up. I'll click enter, that will be added. If you didn't have that text plus node selected uh, and you just searched for it, it probably uh, made it out here floating, but you can select a node, hold shift, drag it over this connection line. You'll see those colors pop up and boom, it will drop it right in there. Now this keyframe stretcher deals with uh, a source and stretch timing controls. The source uh, sets your overall animation. Uh, this animation takes this entire five seconds. So I want this start to be at zero and I want this source to be at 150. Now the stretch start and stretch end, you need to pull those in so that this is only selecting the period where no motion is happening in your title or your effect. So when we have that animation in and out, we don't want to stretch that at all. We want it to come across exactly like we animated. But as soon as that animation is in, we want to stretch the time between the keyframes. So I need to figure out when my animation is done. I said, well, like 30, 35. Um, you can be a little you know, generous with these. I'll set 35 and we started animating at like what, what, 120. I'll just go to 119. Boom. And we can actually sort of preview this. If I go back to my edit page timeline, stretch this out. If I start scrubbing, even though we are past five seconds, this title is holding and at the very end, it finally animates out. Uh, I have snapping on, so that wasn't 
super smooth. And because we use this keyframe stretcher node, you can see this even in the Fusion page. I will pull up my dual viewers here. I'll preview the text on uh, viewer one, the keyframe stretcher on viewer two. And here in this viewer, what's happening? I'm previewing the text here, but I am not seeing it, but I'm seeing it over here. And that's because uh, the text animates on, it holds, and you will see the text animate off in my first viewer, but it's holding on the second viewer because the keyframe stretcher is doing its job and then it finally animates out. Now we can make our macro. I'm gonna select both of these tools, right click and go to macro, create macro. Now, this window is very important. It can get complicated very quick, but uh, like I said, the process of creating a macro, uh, there comes a point where you bundle the nodes and then you choose what controls from the, uh, the actual source nodes you are pulling to that top layer, which is the only thing uh, you can see from the edit page. And this is a process where that happens for a lot of these effects. So I have this text one node and every possible control is, uh, <laughs> is visible here. I am going to close up some of the stuff. I'm not gonna use like these image settings, but under text, we have styled text. That's that main field we entered. But, ooh, haha, -ha, I don't want this because I added that follower modifier. Okay, here's the thing. I think I am gonna use this here, but if I close text, you will see that follower modifier also shows up. Modifiers exist here um, outside of the nodes they are stored on. And if I open up follower in text, I also have this text option and you know, uh, let me just close. I will navigate that uh, inside Fusion. You can see on that text uh, effect itself, if I come to text, this is that styled text field. And if I go to the modifiers text, this is that field. The follower uh, exists on this styled text field. And as you can see, there's only one uh, difference. The keyframe button for the styled text is enabled because that's where the modifier is sort of living. But on the modifier itself, we have a second field for that text entry, which doesn't have a keyframe. So if you wanted to keyframe this for some reason, um, which is flexibility I usually leave in my presets, um, you would need to select this text option on the follower, not uh, the normal styled text tool on the text node itself. But we're running with an assumption we aren't gonna be doing any keyframing on the text itself. So if I hop back into that macro create macro tool, I want styled text and hey, I'll grab font uh, style, these color options and up to size. Now I'm already going to make a note for like edge use cases. Now, if I scroll down to this shading tab here, remember we made that background on the shading tab and say I wanted to have control to change that uh, background color or maybe uh, the height and width of that. I might be good in this example because we're only modifying things on that one shading element tab. But if you start diving into this, you're gonna run into issues um, because the individual controls for each of those shading element tabs, only one set of those are visible at a time depending on what shading tab is selected. We're gonna keep things simple with just the text controls, but if this is a system you circle back to, you want to have lots of different shading element tabs, um, you might have to rig things up a little differently. Again, specifically ask about that. If you would like that in a video, there are a number of workarounds, including really cool stuff like instance nodes, which I don't think I'm gonna talk about in this video, but they are crazy cool. But I'll scroll up, we'll just have those text options, and I'm gonna name this to something like demo idle. I'm gonna come up to file and we need to pause for a quick second. Not pause, but I need to tell you import stuff. <laughs> you could just save, then you would have to do some hunting to figure out where it saved this. Um, you could save as useful because you could choose where you save it to, but we're gonna click the save as group option. You remember that really cool feature I showed off uh, where I brought in the contours effect and you can double click, open it, see all the nodes. That is what saving as group lets you do. If you don't, uh, save as group, if you just save as, then your entire macro will only be visible as a single group which you cannot click to expand. So saving as group is just a way of uh, maximizing that uh, option to come back into Fusion. I'm gonna click save as group, navigate to my desktop, make a new folder here just called demo, and then I'll double click in that and save it. And if I navigate to that folder, on my desktop, boom, we've got demo, and we have that demo title dot setting. And just because I didn't show it off earlier, if I open, uh, if I double click the setting, open it in my text editor, it's just plain text. And I can actually 
uh, select all this text, copy the text itself and paste it in Fusion and it will bring in that effect, which whoop, whoop. And you see, we already have those same controls. I can change this to something like Patrick, me, if, if you were. But, uh, and because we did those shading elements, as long as we type this out to B, the background would stay in place. Cool. But we don't want to deal with just uh, plain text inside Fusion. We want this on the edit page. What do we do? We have options. At the very end of this video, I'm gonna talk about the really cool DRFX system, which is a great way to bundle multiple presets and even uh, stuff like included uh, like media, like included extra graphics, stuff like that. It's super easy to send, super easy to install. But if you are just making your own or making only one at a time, you have a few different options. Number one being digging through your actual like file folder structure to find where all of these things are located. I don't recommend that. <laughs> but if we go back to the Fusion page, this is necessary. You can't do this on the edit page. Open up our effects library and navigate to titles, edit. If I click that edit, uh, sometimes, especially in this window, Fusion needs to think for a second, you will see all of the effects, transitions, titles, thinners in one long list. This is a title, so I could click title. And if we had a subfolder we wanted to drag this into, or if we just wanted it in there as a, a Fusion effect, um, most of the time, there's. I'm gonna show you multiple ways to do this, because uh, like on fresh installs, sometimes this is a little wonky, sometimes uh, like one works over the other. I could drag and drop this title uh, right into this window. Um, if I had a folder, I could do, and I mean, I can do that. If I let go, it will think about that. Uh, and then boom, that scroll, oh, it's thinking, Resolve's thinking. Now I have this long list, but if I now search for demo, we have demo title and I can drag that into Fusion and boom, we've got that effect. Um, but alternatively, uh, say we did wanna put this in a special subfolder, what we could have done is uh, select this titles folder or edit, uh, but if I'm going in titles, I'm gonna click these three dots here and I'm gonna click show folder. Um, this is something that might not work on a fresh install. This, these folder structures get a little funky. If this doesn't work for you, uh, try clicking back to edit, uh, and then those three dots show the folder. And then uh, if you don't have a titles folder, you should be able to create one and click it open. And you can see, I do have a test folder here. It didn't show up because it was empty. But now if I drag that demo title right into the test folder, click back to resolve, It'll also think for a second. Then now if I open up edit uh, titles, we have that test subfolder and boom, demo is the only thing in it. Now I'm gonna save this project real quick. I'm gonna navigate back to the edit page and this can be close to a 50-50 swing, um, whether the edit page recognizes it right away or you have to restart resolve. Let's see if I go to edit. Um, I'm gonna scroll down my timeline a little bit. I'm gonna come to titles. I have that test folder, boom, I have demo title. I can drop it right on my timeline. I have those controls here. My name comes up. I can scale it up. I can change the font. I can do all kinds of other stuff. Boom. Even change the color of my font. Yay. And it will animate. Uh, I could put uh, this under uh, over some footage and it would work. Boom. You've got a drag and drop title here on the edit page. And like I said, you can always hop back into Fusion open up that demo title group, you got your two nodes. Uh, if you want to change that shading element, if you want to add shading elements, ooh, what can we do? We can add some uh, really interesting stuff. Pull it to the front. So you've got this, oh, gross, gross. Don't do this, don't do this. <laughs> Keep it simple, you got a really slick title that you made, boom, you've got it on the edit page, drag and drop. Cool, cool. End of part one. <laughs> so what are we gonna look at for part two? Uh, we're gonna build, ooh, I'm excited for how we're gonna build on things. In part two, we're making a transition. Now I could, um, just like I did for the title, make a blank fusion composition, hop into the fusion page, and I could have that be my starting point for any of the stuff I'm about to make. Um, you can make something to serve as a transition or a title or an effect anytime you're in fusion. But sometimes it helps to uh, have your starting point be a lot uh, closer to uh, the your endpoint. I wanna show off something cool. Okay, 
I've got some uh, clips here. And if I just drag different ones on, I'm going to uh, cut them, cut them, cut them, get rid of the audio, pull them together, boom. So we've got two videos. They just cut from one to the other. And I could come to video transitions and cross on a uh, cross dissolve and then they would cross dissolve between each other. But a specific to this default cross dissolve is a really cool functionality um, that is super useful in this exact use case um, of when you want to make your own transition. I can right click on that cross dissolve and click to convert to fusion cross dissolve. I will click that and uh, you'll see the inspector changes a little bit and importantly adds that little wand icon. So now I can click that the fusion page opens, but remember where previously we just had uh, the text title going into uh, the media out. Now we have two media in nodes and they go into this little cross dissolve node, which if you open it up is just a dissolve node because fusion, you know, has a dissolve node. You can see that media one is that first whole clip. Media two is that second whole clip. And this is possible um, because both of these clips um, exist um, to the other side of the uh, dissolve transition, if that makes sense. This first uh, clip actually exists all the way to the end of the transition. The second clip actually begins at the start of the transition. So we are dealing with just this window of time, but inside Fusion, we have both of those clips for the entire duration. And all we have to do is uh, do whatever we want in Fusion so that we start with this clip and we end with this clip. Now we created this from a fusion cross dissolve. So we have a little dissolve node. I'm going to get rid of that. And here we can build on whatever we want. Again, for this, uh, we're going to keep things a little basic, but still very cool. I'm going to connect the two uh, box, uh, the gray box outputs of these to create just a standard merge node. And if I preview this merge node, you see, oh, it is just taken and pasted on that second clip over. So now it will just go from this first clip. And as soon as it reaches that transition, it will just boom, paste to the second, like a cut, but a little earlier. That's not great. <laughs> but now we are at least combining these two clips together and uh, we can add animation or more tools or lots of stuff um, to uh, affect how this second clip is actually brought on. You can see this merge node does have transform options, but sometimes it's nicer um, if you want to work more with nodes, be a little more visual to keep those a little separate. So uh, coming out of this media in node, I'm just going to add a transform effect. And this lets us do all this stuff, you know, like slide it, move it around, that sort of stuff. And uh, before that, I'm actually going to add a uh, color corrector node. We'll get to that a little later. That'll just be another like a little bit of sauce because I want to show off something cool, something else cool. It's all cool, right? Okay, on this transform node, what we want to do is animate this in. Um, there are a, a number of pre-built um, effects for like slide transitions and kind of that. What we're going to do is rebuild just a simple slide transition, uh, but with the option to choose what angle it slides from. Ooh. So on this transition, I'm going to right click on center and go to modify with vector result. Uh, this is stored as a modifier, but it's pretty cool. You can see if I push up this distance, it slides to the right, right? It's just sliding to the right. But if I slide that up a little bit and then change this angle, it starts orbiting around that center position. But really what I'm doing is changing the angle that it is pushing it that distance. So if I just push it up towards this corner, if I start sliding this up, you see if I get to a value of one, it is completely off of that edge. So I want this animation to slide from a value of one to a value of zero over my duration. Now, um, I could maybe rig that up with a keyframe stretcher, but we have another better option. I'm gonna come uh, make sure I'm on modifiers. I have this distance. I know I want to go from one down to zero. So I'm gonna right click on distance and go to modify with anim curves. Now I've got modifiers on modifiers, uh, but we're, this is still basic. Anim curves, super useful. I have another whole video diving into this a lot more. Um, but hey, we're making a transition, right? So uh, if this source is set to transition, that's great. We have uh, some built in easing options. Sure, I'll do something basic. I think sign is my basic like easy ease curve. Yeah. Okay. So what to know about anim curves, super basic. When the source is set to transition, it will play back this animation over the entire length 
of the transition. So remember, I want to go from a value of one to zero. Right now, this offset is its starting point and the scale is where it goes to, uh, at least in this setting. Again, complicated, but we're keeping it simple. I want this to start at a value of one and go down to zero, so this scale needs to be negative one. So at the beginning, it's off, and then it animates on, comes to a rest. And then just for fun, this time scale, if I pulled that up to two, uh, it would do that in half the time, but I want this to take the whole time, so I'm keeping that up at one. Time offset uh, like pushes it in time, you know. Uh, I could do stuff like pull this time scale up to two, and if this time offset uh, was 0.5, that would be halfway through the transition, so it would only start halfway through the transition, but because it's going twice as fast, it still ends by the end. But again, we don't want that, but that is how that works. So that's pretty solid, uh, but hey, let's also do it on this color corrector just so it's a little different, right? Let's just have this being a uh, plain uh, saturation from zero to one. So on that, I can go to modify with anim curve. We are keeping that transition. We are keeping that uh, as easing with this sine curve. We do want this to go from zero to one. So I'll keep this offset and scale exactly the same, but hey, this is actually a good uh, a, a place to use this time scale and time offset because as this animation is starting, it's mostly off screen, right? So let's save that black and white to color fade for the last half of this effect. That's pretty neat. So I'm changing this time scale to two, the offset to 0.5. So now it stays black and white until it's halfway on. And then in the second half, finally comes to full color. And then it's at a rest. If we hop back to the fusion edit page, to check, boom, we've got halo, the division, neat. And because we used anim curve, if I pull up the length as cross dissolve, it will do that same move, just slow, more slowly over that time. Now, this is something interesting, as you might have noticed uh, in this, whoops, I've got to click that dissolve, click this little open, uh, the icon to open it in the fusion page. Uh, as you might have spotted on this modifier, on this vector, this distance goes up to a value of one, which if we change this to come in from the side, perfectly has it just off screen. But if we have this at a value of like 90 to come from above, it actually starts way off screen. And so it takes like over half the duration to even get to, to come in on screen. So uh, maybe that's something where like in anim curves, uh, I publish these scale and offsets. That's just something to be aware of. That's something to be aware of. Uh, if you publish these scale and offsets, especially if you are using your end result, you can uh, uh, dial in that animation on the edit page. It's pretty cool. Uh, we're probably not gonna do that. Just something to be aware of, of, of how the effect will look best coming from the sides. Um, but if we have it coming from the corners, then that'll be pretty good too. But hey, we've got this effect. And uh, now we need to talk about packaging this up. And I don't know if there are different schools of thought, um, but Fusion allows a certain amount of redundancy, right? This media in one and media in two, if we include those in our transition, uh, they will work. But in the final transition, uh, if you were to open it up in Fusion, you would see these nodes duplicated because the uh, transition itself is sort of expecting two open inputs on our effect. So if I grab this merge up through to this color corrector and actually just group those, you'll see here we have this group, but it still has uh, that background and foreground. The background expects media in one, the foreground expects media in two. This is like how they, I believe, how they want you to do it. So let's do it that way. I'm just gonna select those nodes up through, right click, macro, create macro. I'll call this demo transition and close out because there's one more thing I want to show you, right? On this transform, we probably don't want to change any of these options, uh, but we might want to, for whatever reason, uh, just do a normal slide. Don't do this saturation uh, effect along the way. Now, if I click on this color character node, come over to settings, we have this blend option, uh, which is sort of like the, you can think of it like the master opacity slide just for the effect. If I pull this all the way down, the footage will be full 
color from the first moment you see it. On the color corrector, this blend mode um, is sort of how effective it is. So if it's up, uh, it is uh, allowing this node to process. If you pull it all the way down, the node is effectively not doing nothing, anything. So we could publish this blend control and have them decide how strong it is, or this is a little advanced, but very cool. I'm gonna right click. I could either right click up here on the title of color corrector node or on the node itself. I'm going to go to edit controls. Now this is a complicated window. If you thought the macro thing was complicated, this is also complicated. We're gonna do one very basic thing. I'm gonna click this ID dropdown and we are looking for blend. It's the second option. And in this input control, we're gonna scroll down to where we see checkbox control. I'm gonna click okay. It will create a new user folder here in our inspector. If I click that, now that blend option instead of a slider is a button. And if I turn it on, you see that footage goes black and white and then it, it does the whole effect. It fades on at the end. If I uncheck it, it's color the entire time. I now have a real cool checkbox toggle on or off for, for this extra saturation effect. And uh, that's helpful because I'm pretty sure that's gonna be uh, the only control I publish for this transition. So I will select those nodes, right click, macro, create macro. I need to find this color corrector. I need to uh, close these down till we have the user window blend. I will check that. And then now another really cool feature of this macro tool is you can see like this is the tool and then it has this text box. So I can rename this uh, uh, on its its later control from blend to something like uh, desaturate. Cool. I am calling this demo transition file save as group. I am saving to my desktop in that demo folder. Save. We're gonna do that same process we did before. We're opening up templates. Edit transitions. I'm gonna show that folder. We have an empty test folder. I can pull up this demo folder. Now we also have demo transition. If I drop it in there, click back to Fusion, it'll think for a second. I might try, I might try hopping right over to the edit page to see if it's there. And then I'm actually gonna copy this footage, paste it down there uh, and get rid of this transition to apply it all over again. If we come to video transitions, test, demo transition, boom, you can drop it right on there. And uh, we have that little desaturate option. You can see if I, if I give it extra space here, it's sliding in, do you want it desaturated or not? Boom, you can do that right on the edit page. Uh, transitions normally look pretty good, shorter, so. Boom, you've just made a transition and got it back on the edit page. So it's drag and drop. You're doing so great. Now, I specifically showed uh, uh, this title and transition first because in the title, remember, we showed off that keyframe stretcher uh, node or tool. And uh, in this transition, we showed off uh, the anim curves modifier. And next, we're gonna put them together to do even more cool time stuff, time, cool time stuff. Because next, we're making an effect, and we're actually going to make a super cool effect. So, part three is an effect. So, to get to a starting point for building our preset so far, we've had a, a fusion composition that we opened up to start our title. Uh, we converted a, a normal cross dissolve into a fusion cross dissolve that we then opened up to get our two media ins. Next, we're building an effect. Um, so, yeah, you've got multiple different ways you could do it, as always, but uh, you know, let's just drop footage on the timeline. And then uh, with our playhead over that footage, let's just open the fusion page. Boom, you got a media in and you got a media out and you got our little clip. Let's start building an effect. Oh, I just remembered earlier, I talked about how we might not talk about instance nodes. We are gonna talk about instance nodes, building this effect, cool. Uh, we are going to build a little uh, zoom isolation effect deal. Say you wanted to zoom into a part of screen and circle it and it, that's what we're doing. I'm going to build it and then you'll see what we're doing. And we're also going to touch on just some like cool fusion fundamentals along the way. Okay. Uh, we've got our media in, media in two. Uh, in that little window, 
I'm gonna add a transform node. And I'm gonna kinda, kinda like build an effect before we animate it together. This transition is gonna zoom in, but we want to limit that zoom. So I'm gonna make an ellipse mask and uh, mask it to that transform. So if I preview the transform and then start pulling it up, you'll see it is only zooming inside that circle. That is cool, but you might notice, uh, especially on subtler, subtler zooms, it can be hard to sort of notice that outline. So we want to uh, take that uh, same circle mask and apply it in a little different way uh, to a solid outline. So I'm gonna click this first background layer option. I'm gonna make this white instead. So I'm gonna click this ellipse, Control C, click out here, Control Shift V. I paste uh, what is called an instanced node. An instance node is like a linked copy. If I preview that instance node, you see all of these controls have this little green outline. So if I preview uh, ellipse one, viewer one, ellipse two on viewer two, they look the same. If I change anything, it changes them both. But if I right click on any of these controls like border width and I go to D instance, now if I pull up that border width, it's affecting the second one, but not the first one. I also want to D instance solid. So if I uncheck that, and pull down this border width, we just have a little border. And that is what is going to mask this uh, uh, solid. And if I merge that over the transform, boom, we've got a zoom with an outline. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And all the other controls uh, still stay linked. So if I pull down this width, you know, it, it does it for both of those at the same time. So we built something, we can start animating it soon, but uh, there is one thing <laughs> we need to handle uh, first. We're gonna publish uh, from this ellipse, this center uh, for the user to be able to move this around. And you can either change that in the inspector or just drag in the viewer here. But you might notice, say I want to zoom in uh, right to this corner, to this little gold value down here. If I change the circle, especially if I am zoomed in a whole lot, if I just move the circle as is, down to that corner, the gold value isn't there. It's scaled up so far that it has uh, pushed that corner of the image way off screen. But what I can do uh, on this ellipse, I'm going to right click on center and go to publish. And that sort of adds just that control as a standalone modifier. But what that lets us do is come to transform. I'm gonna right click on pivot, connect to, that ellipse center and boom, the gold value comes right back. Ding, 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 where's the gold? Oh, gold right in the corner. So you can go right up to the edge and see everything right up to the edge. It sort of zooms like you would think a magnifying glass would. Um, that is uh, essential for this kind of effects. You just got to uh, link the pivot or the sort of like offset for that zoom to the center of this ellipse. But now we can animate. And in this kind of effect, uh, like yeah, the transform, we could also uh, over time zoom in, but all we really need to do is just animate the size of the circle. Because when it is scaled down completely, it will be completely gone. And then as the circle comes up, uh, it will reveal the zoomed in area. And this is gonna combine so much of what we've talked about already. It's gonna be cool. Check it out. Okay, <laughs> on this ellipse here, I'm gonna right click on width and modify with anim curves. And before I do anything, I'm gonna right click on height and connect to anim curves value. Uh, as soon as you add a modifier or as soon as you even keyframe any value, you are able to uh, connect to that control from any other control using that connect menu. So powerful. Oof, again, I could talk just about that. But uh, you can see now uh, that anim curves, which we haven't dialed in at all, is now driving both that height and width. And remember uh, that starting point, uh, that offset starts at zero. Now uh, this width by default, the scale is set to one. This, uh, the defaults will change based on what uh, kind of control you drop it on. So over time, this goes from zero all the way up to two, which hey, way too big, but I'll give us some room here. So just to set that size, you know, you could come to the end and you know, pull this down to whatever size you might want it. 
but we don't want this motion to take the entire time, right? Uh, we want this to be an effect. So we want this to, you know, scale up and stay there until the effect is done. That's where we're gonna change this source from transition to uh, custom. Cool, this is cool, this is cool. So uh, the other options at both duration and transition, uh, over the course of your clip or your transition, they will generate uh, a number from zero up to one. At the end, it gives you a value of one. But when you set this to custom, you can uh, set that zero and one at whatever timing you want, and uh, also push it past one, in which case uh, this scale uh, is multiplicative. So if I have, you know, it's scaling up to a value of one, like we set this here, but if I keyframe this up to a value of two, hey, it'll be twice as big. But I want that, uh, oh, I'm not keyframing yet. So at frame zero, we want this at a value of zero. We'll just come forward, we'll let's say, let's say 20 frames, up to a value of one. Uh, we will go ahead, I think. No, we don't. We wanna set this curve to linear, um, cause, cause we're gonna do this stuff a little different, right? Because uh, at the very end of this clip, you know, this is a long clip, right? So uh, what were we at? Uh, five seconds was 150 frames, right? Let me just come up to 150 counter here. Let me go back one, uh, just to be safe. I'm gonna set that keyframe and then come back to 130 or 129 then keyframe back down. So this will look a little interesting, right? But it will scale up, hold for five seconds, and then scale back down. Now, a few things we need to track down. Uh, number one, we aren't using uh, this curve here uh, because it gets a little funky. Remember, this input is going up and then down, and if we add added easing, it would ease like on the whole animation and not each individual move. But if I open up my spline viewer, we can see uh, it's duplicated here, but these are, you know, linked. If I click this to scale, we see that move. Uh, we can preview those keyframes we made on the input of the anim curves in this spline viewer, super useful. I will click and just do our super simple, nah, we'll do more. Uh, we have the super simple ease, but I will select that first curve, press T, pull this ease in up to like 70, that first ease out up to like 50 and then uh, reverse that on the out so it eases out 70 and 50 cool so now it's like pretty that that's how you know it's good as the sound effects okay so we have an effect, but we wanted this effect to last as long as whatever clip we drop it on, right? And uh, anim curves, this way we've done, we've purposefully limited our effect to the sort of five minute window, but this is when we can layer on keyframe stretcher again. But, 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 oh, actually maybe not. Oh, this is actually interesting, okay, so um, I'm gonna show off something that sometimes is essential. In this case, maybe not the most essential. It would have been essential if we also keyframed in this zoom. Uh, but since we're not doing that, uh, if I come to the very last merge and I tried to add in that keyframe stretcher, it is actually looking at this whole video and stretching that. So the, our animation was only five seconds, but if we set this keyframe stretcher like we did before, it would stretch the five seconds of the video over the whole length of the video, which we don't want. We only want to stretch the effect. So we could always place this uh, keyframe stretcher uh, here. Uh, you get some like funky masking stuff. Uh, the point being, we're not doing that. We are going to do something a little different where we are using keyframe stretcher as a modifier. Keyframe stretcher can be a node, but if I go back to this anim curves, uh, we have these uh, keyframes of our circle scaling up under this uh, custom source. I'm going to right click on this input and go to insert keyframe stretcher. And boom, now we've got another modifier on a modifier. And these controls are exactly the same. So this uh, source 
is a 150. And what, we did 20 frames each. So our stretch start as well, just like 21 for a safe window. And we started this at what, what, 129? We'll go to 128. Boom. Now, check it, check it. Nothing else new, no new, new, no new node appeared. But if I preview that actual media out, then that circle will scale up and it will hold the entire length of our clip and then it will scale out. Very cool. Now, there are some points I wanna make about usage of an effect like this on the edit page, um, but those points are really kind of problems um, that I'm gonna solve uh, by a uh, spoiler alert, sort of using this effect uh, also as the generator we're gonna make, it's gonna be pretty cool, but that means it's time to package this up uh, as a macro. And this will by far be our most complicated macro. Let's take a second to talk about what controls we want to have access to, right? We have this zoom, we want this zoom size. On this ellipse, we want both the center and uh, on the instance ellipse, we need the border width. And on this background, we need the color. If I was just doing options to have options, I would probably come to this merge and do that same checkbox control from before on the overall blend. So you could say, hey, do you want an outline? Do you not? But let's assume you want an outline because outlines are great. And hey, you could also always bring the border width down to zero if you really don't want it. But let's select all of these nodes. We are leaving this media in uh, one out to leave an open input so that when you drop this node uh, right on an effect that it will recognize that open input and pipe in whatever footage it is uh, dropped on into the effect. So with those selected, I will go to macro, create macro. I will call this demo the effect. And on the ellipse, we want the, what did we say? Controls, yes. We want the center. We'll just call this like zoom center on, ooh, the anim curves, right? Uh, on the anim curves scale, this is dictating the circle size. I forgot we were doing this one. Uh, I don't want any of these other anim curves. Uh, keyframe stretcher, no. Instance, uh, we wanted border width. So uh, instead of border width, I will just call this outline width on this background. We want this color. Uh, which here, the way this color works is kind of funky. Uh, you need to select all these different options because color controls are actually kind of, wait, top, no, not that one. Just all these top left, uh, red, green, blue, alpha, that's what makes the color. So close that up and shoot, what did I say? Oh, transform size is zoom amount. That's the stuff we want, yeah, yeah. It is tricky to add this stuff back in after the fact. So it's worth taking uh, your time here. A lot of times I will pull up just a, a plain uh, note document and like type this all out beforehand. But now if I go to file, uh, save as group, save that to my little desktop demo option, demo effect, save, close, effects, templates, edit, uh, effects, like before, I already have that demo or uh, that uh, test folder, uh, but because it's empty, it's not showing up. So I will go to show folder, test folder, demo effect, drop it in there. Let resolve think. Hey, and I'll risk it by going right back to the edit page where I can try to open up effects test, boom, demo effect. And you know, for this, uh, let me grab a, a little bit of a longer clip. This could be a much longer clip. Okay. So here's the thing about effects, right? And if I have this whole long clip on here, I drag on the effect, come to the beginning. It will, starting from the very beginning, droop, animate in, hold, through your, your however long clip, and then the very, very end, shoo, animate out. Uh, it is visible on this last frame because, you know, by the next frame, the whole clip's gone. So it's kind of, 
it, it all wraps up at the, as the same time as the clip. But uh, there is one interesting, uh, maybe an issue, it's, it's kind of an issue. Let's say you wanted that zoom to happen at a specific time, right? I haven't built in a way to adjust timing in the effect itself. So if I got rid of that and say, I just wanted, you know, a zoom to happen at this uh, scoreboard section, whether I trim the entire clip or, you know, just cut the clip to that short section and then uh, drop the effect on, spoiler alert, it's gonna be broken. It's gonna boom, snap right up uh, and then snap right off. Uh, because uh, you'll see what happens if I select this clip and open it in the Fusion page. The Fusion page knows that this is a section of the much longer clip and the way this has been built, that keyframe structure is still looking at frame zero and it's looking at frame zero of the entire clip. A quick workaround here, you know, would be to uh, uh, just uh, make a compound clip and then you could drag it on. This sort of like resets the timing there. Hi there, Patrick from the future here. Uh, because sometimes when you're making a really long, really cool, personally important video, you lose footage and then you deal with it. So <laughs> I will be able to occasionally intercut with, you know, previous Patrick and, you know, he'll, he'll handle wrapping up the whole video, uh, but we have some stuff to handle. So like you just saw to uh, wrap up the uh, effects portion of the video, if you create an effect that you want to have very deliberate timing, um, that has a few extra hurdles you have to jump through. A lot of time uh, making a simple compound clip can help you out there, but again, that's something you need to know. But a lot of the included fusion effects or fusion effects um, that lots of people, I think even myself have made, uh, are either just static or ongoing effects that you drop on a clip and then uh, you either come up with a way to transition in and out of them, or you know, you just you just cut away, you do, you do anything up to you timing wise. Lots of edge cases around this topic. Um, if you want any more information on this, I'm probably gonna direct you over to my Anim Curves video, the entire video all about Anim Curves, cause that touches a bit more on timing and then some options you have there. But we are going to move on to uh, generators and the past Patrick can handle uh, the start of that. Okay, we've been floating around a generator for a little bit. Uh, what is it why are we using it here? We aren't just using it uh, to fix this like little timing issue. It will help with that. Um, but there are also just some like benefits to making effects as a generator. Um, but one important thing to know first, like I've mentioned, uh, Resolve treats your preset differently, whether you put it in the effects or the titles folder, just for those two examples. Effects, it wants to drop directly on a clip. A title is sort of standalone. A generator is like a title in that regard and like a title, in every other regard. Anything you would build as a standalone title, you could put in a generator. Largely, I just break it down into like, is it, is it, you know, text forward text the most important thing? It's probably a title. Is it some sort of graphic on screen? Uh, it, it's probably a generator. But in this case, we're also sort of using an effect as a generator and it's gonna be pretty cool. Um, and to do this, we're gonna hop into that same comp where we just built our effect. And we're gonna keep it exactly as is for now, except we're gonna get rid of that media in node and do something a little funky. Um, are we? Wait, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna duplicate this clip, uh, drag it up and then deselect. So we're only looking at this bottom copy and I'm gonna right click and reset fusion composition. Boom, I'm gonna delete that effect. It's just this gameplay. If I toggle on the second one, the effect is still there, but I'm gonna open that back up now and get rid of the media in. Uh, everything else goes away because this transform now no longer has an input. So we could preview like these ellipses by themselves, but we can't preview the transform because it's only like being masked, nothing is being plugged into it. But I can create a new media in node. And if I preview that by itself, um, because we are inside an effect, this is working. So, so you know what I'll do? I will just copy these nodes, boom, get rid of it, drag in a new fusion composition. Hey, we built this to be five seconds anyway. I'll open that fusion composition. There's nothing there. We'll paste in the nodes, connect them up, and then 
if I make a new media in node, there'll be nothing. It's not connected to anything. This is a blank fusion composition. Until inside that media in node, we come to media source and change it to background. Boom. This is so cool. This, this popped into Fusion a few versions ago, and it's pretty much like a Fusion page adjustment clip. All right, we're back already. Uh, we were showing off this really cool option in the media in that this media source to background, and boom, it shows off whatever is underneath that on the edit page. So you have the same copy of this effect that if you actually, you know, move this around, it still all works great, except it's sort of standalone now on the edit page. And one big benefit of this is timing. Um, you know where we had to uh, create that compound clip for that start and end. Now, if I just pull this end on the edit page, it recognizes those and uh, that keyframe stretcher will stretch to the bounds of this fusion composition. But it's not hard to see other valuable things about doing it this way. For some people, it will just be nice to have this effect, you know, visible on the edit page taking up a space on a timeline, you can see exactly when it begins, exactly when it ends. And there's something to be said for how it's not actually uh, interacting or affecting the clip itself. It's just sort of referencing it um, for this generator. Additionally, this is also nice because it does sort of function uh, like that adjustment clip where you could have multiple different clips, you know, scaled and rearranged and toss this on top of all of them. And it will apply that effect to like an adjustment clip, everything beneath it on the edit page without you having to, you know, uh, pre-compose any clips or add them together in a fusion clip or, you know, build your entire thing over in fusion. Now from here, the last step would be to select all of this and go through that process again to uh, group those into a macro. Very important to note is that uh, with this generator, you would have to include that media in um, because, you know, that generator standalone, it's not an effect that is looking for an input. Um, that actual action is ha happening um, inside the media in with this background media source. So you just select all of that, then right click macro and go through that same process that we've shown off a few times now. Again, you select your controls, you save out that setting. Um, you can drag it right back into the Fusion page if you got a folder set up or go to that um, find in folder option, drag the setting over there. But what if you don't like any of that. What if you want a different way to install your custom uh, presets and plugins and templates for Resolve? Then we might look at our last section covering DRFX. It's, it's one thing if you're just like building and prototyping um, and you wanna drag something real quick to test it on the edit uh, page. But if you have a preset or plugin or you know a whole suite of titles, whatever that you've built, um, by far the best option um, really to install all those at once, but also to, you know, share or sell them or, you know, just keep things organized is DRFX. Almost all of my plugins and presets use this DRFX system. It's so great. If you've downloaded, you know, any of my free presets, even um, it gets you this DRFX. You just double click it um, and whatever the creator of that DRFX has, you know, bundled together, it's instantly sorted. All those subfolders are created. Um, it has a number of side features that are really, really really cool. So let's walk through how to put one together. So we've got this demo folder, right? Where we toss things. I didn't uh, remake the uh, generator settings. So we just have these three, but we can still show off stuff fine with this, right? So to start creating a DRFX, uh, we need a new folder and we're just gonna name that edit with a capital E. Um, capitals are important. And we're gonna drag all those three, the effect title and transition into there, then open it up because um, we're going to end up dragging these a few different folders in. And what we're actually doing here, if I check this out, open up my effects library uh, in the Fusion page, open up templates, we have this edit folder and we're recreating the folder structure from here on out. So if I open that up, you see we have effects, generators, titles and transitions. So back in this demo folder, I'm going to recreate those folders for uh, every one of those categories we have here. So effect, title, and transition. So I will just make effects, titles, and transitions. And I'll just drag in transition into that, title into that, effect into that. Um, One last thing, um, just so these aren't floating around, like we did manually inside these DRFX, you can also create uh, further subfolders. If I go to new folder in here and then here, I will just make demo. I'm also gonna uh, copy this folder before anything is inside of it to easily recreate on the other ones. But then I will drag that one layer deeper in titles. I will paste and drop that in and in effects, 
I will paste and drop that in. Great, I go all the way back. We have this one edit folder. I'm just gonna right click. Uh, I have seven zip for creating zip folders and compressing files. You can also do this uh, natively in Windows, uh, but I'm gonna go to uh, add to archive or you know create zip folder. I'll just do those default options, which is what would happen if you created this without this file. And you end up with just a zip folder, right? The standard, whatever, compressed files. But uh, if I rename this, I can now recall and name this to like something like demo and change it from .zip to .drfx. And if I click off, I'll get a warning being like, hey, you're messing with stuff, but I know what I'm messing with. And it will actually change that logo. And if I double click to install that, we will get a pop-up in Resolve saying, hey, do you want to install demo? We do. I will click install. Resolve will go through that normal thinking process when you're adding new effects. We had the window open. So now if I go back to the edit page, open up titles, we have that uh, demo folder. Oh, and we have the title and transition. Oh, at some point I messed that up. So I would clean up that DRFX. <laughs> but if we go to uh, transitions, that yeah, we just have transition. And what was the last one? Oh, effects, demo. We have, oh, effect and transition. Oh, I think when I was copying the folder, I, I doubled up some stuff. Whoops, take care of your DRFX. <laughs> But all of those folders, uh, you know, created all those subfolders. We installed three presets in a matter of seconds. You can, you know, put tons of stuff in a DRFX in all these different folders. They're also super valuable and amazing resource for DRFX. If you come up to this help drop down, go to documentation developer, it will open this folder. You open up Fusion Templates, README, and boom, we've got a notepad document with tons of really interesting info. It talks about DRFX down here, but uh, important to note if you scroll up a little bit, uh, template icons. You can do this if you're manually installing them, but it's also super helpful in DRFX. If you have a uh, small PNG file, um, if I hop over to um, effects and just come to some of my own, you see a lot of mine have a custom thumbnail next to the effect. And if you have that small PNG, uh, the resolution noted is in that doc, and it's just the same name as your dot setting file, but instead of dot setting, it's dot PNG, uh, it will link that together. DRFX is also great uh, for including um, like still media, like images that you would want to be part of an effect. I have some lower third templates and some other things, stuff like logo designs, or if you're creating a lot of customized lower thirds, you can have your headshot as part of the effect or you know any headshot or like a temporary headshot if you want the user to swap swap that out. You can include that media, uh, bundle it in a DRFX, and you're still only sending one file to someone else. They're installing it with one click. And that necessary media stays linked up correctly inside Fusion um, if it's like referenced in that DRFX. It's super cool. But even that core level functionality of just bundling lots of effects together and then easily sharing and installing them, DRFX is, is pretty great. I know talking DRFX is like one step out from you know creating these things themselves, but especially if you dive into it, um, building like a, a small functional DRFX it is super helpful for, you know, sharing your work with the world. Cool? Cool. For some of you in the know, you might know that this uh, is also what my presentation at last year's ResolveCon walked through as well. Um, I also did run out of time in that presentation, um, but I also wanted it in this format as well. So, thanks for sticking around. Um, like I mentioned several times, there are there are a, uh, several more things I would love to talk about at like one one step up. Uh, that one thing we did of making a checkbox, like that is an entire workflow that I've, I've shown up that off a bit more recently, um, but like super powerful for this kind of stuff. We haven't even gotten, you can make like drop down labels to store certain amounts of presets. That would probably be something I would also talk about in a follow up. If you want to follow up, uh, let me know. But for now, I, hey, if you actually watch this video, I'll, I can see like analytics and stuff, but if you watch this video to the end, it'd be pretty cool if you let me know. Um, you all don't need to comment, but if you see someone else commenting about watching all the way through, comment on that one. And then, and then maybe we'll get them called off. Or you can just comment on your own, especially if you thought the video was cool. Hey, here's the thing I didn't talk about. Those DRFX, you can also just sell those. That's what I do. I've made dozens of, of presets that are all these DRFX built just like this. I'm a little tired. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.